everyone. Thank you for joining our session, uh, What I Wish I Knew, Work-Life Balance. Um, this is put on by Committee S806, um, Young Professional Activities Committee. Uh, we do meet every Monday of the convention. Today we're meeting, our committee meeting is at 3 p.m. I would encourage anybody on this uh, webinar to, um, to join us this afternoon. Um, we do put on a What I Wish I Knew session every single fall convention. So if you're ever interested in getting involved, we would certainly uh, love to introduce ourselves and um, get you involved in the committee. Um, this committee does not have any uh, PDH credits, um, but we do think that this is going to be a, um, a session worthwhile um, as this topic is very important to each of us on the, that will speak today. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mohammed and Danielle to introduce themselves. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Ipatanoni. I'm a member of the committee and I would be uh, co-moderating this uh, session with Danielle. Uh, we have five speakers in, in total today, our panelists. Uh, so I think what we'll do is we each will introduce ourselves. So I will move to Danielle and then each of the panelists will introduce themselves too. Thanks, Mohammed. Hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Kennedy. I'm a research civil engineer at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab up in Hanover, New Hampshire. So welcome to our session, and I'm going to pass it off to Samar. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Samar Haz. I'm a structural engineer with ICC, International Code Council, and um, do a lot of work with Seismic and Retrofit Committee and Building Up Code Action Committee and Fire Safety Committee. And for my education, I have a bachelor's degree in civil structural engineering and a master's degree in engineering management from Eastern. Thank you. Alvaro? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alvaro Riz. I graduated with my PhD from the University of Miami last year, and I'm currently <clears throat> sorry, the Director of Engineering and Business Development for MAFIC. Thank you. Andres? Good morning, everybody. My name is Andres Matos. Uh, I'm the Junior Engineer for Flood Testing Labs out in Chicago, and I mostly do geotech and material testing, and I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West Campus. Great. Nishant? Hi, everyone. I'm Nishant Garg. I'm an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I got my PhD in Aarhus University, Denmark, uh, and after that, I got a postdoctoral work at Princeton University. I work on the characterization um, of uh, cementitious materials, and I'm really uh, glad to be participating in this panel. We are too, thank you. And then Kayla? Hi everyone, I'm Kayla Lumberdozy. I'm a superintendent at TPR Construction in the Concrete self Reform Group in the Phoenix, Arizona area. I've been in the industry a little over six years, um, boots on the ground, run and work every day. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree from Arizona State in Concrete Industry Management, Construction Management. All right, thanks. I think that's all of our panelists. So do we want to go back to Lauren and Mohammed? Sure, so thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, so just a brief overview of what we are going to do today. Uh, we have some prepared questions uh, that we will ask uh, our panelists, uh, but we are also monitoring uh, the Q&A box. So if you have any uh, questions that you would like us to ask our panelists, uh, you can please uh, put it there and we can look at it and. Uh, make sure that that one gets uh, answered. Uh, so I'll start with the first one. And uh, the first question is, how many hours are you expected to work each week? Uh, we would like to get an answer from each of our panelists. And I think we can start in the same order. So somehow I can go first. Yeah, I think for me, it's not expected from me. Um, at some point, you get to your profession that you want to get things done. So you're going to spend as much as you need to. Um, so I would say usually, especially when we have a lot of deadlines per week, I would say 10 hours per day. Um, now, usually I try to step up 4 or 4.30 and then come back at 6 or something for a couple, for a couple more hours. But that's kind of standard when you need to get things done. 
Uh, thank you, Samhar. Uh, Alvaro? Yeah, it's a little bit like Samhar. I mean, I'm expected, my contract says 40 hours per week, but then it all depends. I'm pretty, have a pretty flexible schedule. So there are some weeks that you need to put in some more hours, but some others that you can take a little bit more rest. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh, Andres? Uh, I, I will agree with Alvaro. Uh, it's the same. It, I'm expected to do 40, uh, but it depends. If I'm in the office, I'm, I can, I usually do like 50. Uh, now, if it's field work, that's different. You start, you know where you start, you don't know where you end. Um, so that can be anywhere from 50 to 60 to 65. It, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, some days are longer, but it will depend on what you do. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, I don't have a defined uh, number of working hours, but I think a good uh, rule of thumb that I follow is um, if I work uh, seven to eight hours and that's productive work in a day, and I think that's that's enough for me. In a day after that, I my mind doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Kila? So I'm kind of in the same boat as Andre, is it? Being on a job site every day, all day, especially in a concrete self-performed type of world, it your schedule is kind of dictated by the four schedule. So if you have a late night four, that is what it is. So you kind of try to balance it based on what's going on that week, but usually anywhere from 50 to 65 hours a week. Okay, thank you. Um... So the next question uh, will be, how often have you worked during vacations? And uh, again, uh, for this one, we would like to get an answer from all, uh, all our panelists. So we'll start with somewhere. Yeah, I think it's based on the teamwork you're working with and the company you're working with. Sometimes if you have been assigned a project, so it's better not to take any vacation especially when you get closer to the deadline. Um, now, at some point I had to work on vacation, again, just because I've been assigned as a main engineer on a project. So at least I need to answer questions or answer phone calls when somebody asked me for. Now, the best way to try to avoid that is just, um, that's what I usually do, but sometimes it doesn't work. But I try to get everything done, at least the couple of weeks before my vacation, get all the all, everything back, called everybody I need to talk to. So at least when I get closer to my vacation, there there isn't anything pending on me. If anything urgent, that could be dealt with later, but it's just kind of good planning. We'll try to avoid that. Um, so I would say usual in vacation, maybe the first day or two, I had to answer some questions, but um, that's, that's usually how it works. Thank you, Samhar. Uh, Alvaro? Yeah, I think in my case, it's, it's a little different because I'm originally from, from Spain and being in the U.S. working, it's a little challenging to go back and visit family and friends. So the agreement that I reached with, with my company was that since it doesn't make sense for me to go for four days to Spain, I usually go a little more. But I most of the times, I don't take official vacation. So I go to Spain for, for one month, but I keep working like part-time every day while I'm there. But that allows me to be at least a couple of months per year in Spain, which is actually what, what, I, what I really like. So, so it's basically no, no vacation, but a lot of flexibility. Good. Uh, Andres? Um, I, I guess in my case, it, it depends. Um, because in general, I'm trying not to. <laughs> I try, but there is always something. And especially as Samar said, if you are the main contact or the main person in charge for something, you're definitely getting a call at some point. Um, especially in our world that we do inspection and some of them are highly specialized. And there is like two people that can do the inspection, you and your boss. And it's really hard to just tell your boss, hey, go and do it. Um, so it, it will depend on, on what you do and your expertise. Um, I try to keep it at a minimum because that's the time for us to decompress and, and kind of relax a little bit. Um, it doesn't work all the time, 
but it, it will depend on what you're doing. Um, in general, I like to prepare for vacations, mine and my uh, supervisor's vacation. So that way we can have everything in line that if I go out, somebody else knows where are we in each project. Um, again, we try, uh, there is it's construction. Anything can happen at any moment. Um, so, but we try to plan ahead for and say, okay, I'm going to be out for this week for ACI. Um, so everybody knows and everybody's aware that I won't be available right away. So it's a matter of pre-planning a little bit before, uh, but it changes from day to day. I try not to, but it always works. Thank you, Andre. Um, Nishant? Yeah, I mean, I think it's in today's world, it's uh, hard to kind of separate work from the, you know, when you're on a vacation, very, everything is coming on email. So I think, um, yeah, I, I will just, I guess, say when I'm in, I want to stay away from work, I try to turn off the notifications and then I will just turn them on when I'm back to <laughs> ready to take it. <laughs> uh, so when I first started, in the industry, I would field every phone call and look at every email when I was on vacation because I felt I needed to stay engaged and never really separate myself from the job site. But as I started to grow in my career, I started to realize that my vacation wasn't vacation anymore. And I was spending all of that time working. So I have learned to remind people, especially the foreman and a lot of people on the team, like every day for a whole week leading up to vacation, if you have questions, if you need something, this is the week. And that's it. <laughs> um, but every night I would still lay in bed, just do a quick check, but try not to engage. That's, that's the biggest part of it so that you can take that time and spend time with your family and your friends and decompress. Awesome. Uh, thank you all. So we, we have a question from the audience now uh, that I think we'd like to take and then go back to our prepared questions. Uh, how do you like to spend your lunch break? And since we we have this from the audience, so I would guess like two answers. So raise your hand if you want to do it or speak. What was the balance? Actually, for me, I try to leave the office. There is a small park behind our office. So I'll take my lunch and go there because I need to just disconnect from what's going on at least for an hour and come back. Okay. What lunch break? <laughs> <laughs> That's my question too, Andres. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can plan for eating the best lunch ever. That moment when you open your little container that's when the pump break. That's when the concrete truck hits a column. That's when the air meter explodes. Everything will happen the moment you open your container. So I try to plan for it. Again, if I'm in the office, it's fairly nice. Usually I get all the calls from 11.30 to 1. Um, but if you're in the field, get a vest that have a lot of pockets and put a lot of snacks because you will need it. Okay. No, great. Um, so back to our last, uh, and again, for the audience, please, if you have any questions, it's uh, it's very um, good to put them in the Q&A Q &A box and then we'll, we'll make sure we get an answer from our banners. Uh, have you ever realized that your work life was out of balance? And uh, for this one, we will have two of our banners uh, answer the question. Uh, so it's certainly some hard. Yeah. Um, it usually when you just start a new job or you just start your own career, your job going to be priority all the time, at least when you first start. So the feeling of, all right, I need to get things done as soon as possible because I want to show my ability because that's that's your opportunity to show how much you can do or how how professional you are. Um, but then the more it gets into it, for example, for me, I used to get things done within 20, 44, eight hours based on previous job or at least respond within those days. But then at some point you get to, all right, I need, the, all you have is eight to 10 hours per day. So whatever you get done that day, that 
that would be fine and then you can do it next day. So um, that's how you can maintain your balance. Just try to commit to specific hours. Um, I think that would give you a good balance between, all right, you can step at these hours and then move on to something else. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Andres? Yeah, I have to agree with Samar. Um, it, when you first start, you, you're trying to learn your ropes, basically. You, you're trying to see where you fit, how you fit, and what actually you're what you have to do and what you're good at. And then they are not necessarily the same thing. Um, and you will find that out when you start working with your team. And, and at some point, your own team will say, hey, I think you should be doing this instead of that. And, and that's when you start seeing, okay, I'm, I'm unbalancing here because I'm doing too much of what I'm not good at, but I still have to do it. And, and it takes me more time. And I, I'm putting 12 hours in something that someone else in my team can do it for 20 minutes. I mean, that's a big difference, but it's just an example. Um, so it, it is a matter of understanding what you're doing and, and don't be afraid at first. Try to, you know, keep it together, take it easy and, and learn your role. Okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what I want to be. Um, in my case, when I was made an assistant project manager, uh, it was in the middle of a pandemic. It was a great idea. Um, so it was like, oh, what now? Because I still had some responsibilities from my prior position. So it was kind of like, okay, I need to get that done, but I need to fulfill my new uh, duties. And it was kind of like a mess everywhere uh, until I say, okay, no, I, I need to put this in a list and I need to go one by one and, and get it done when I get it done. And, and that's what I did. Um, but in order to do that, you need to sit down with your team, see what is expected, at least have an idea and try to prioritize. Okay, these projects are going for bed. Okay, this have to go first. Or, hey, these people are designing. I need to do that. And it's a matter of learning your rope. So I will say, whoever is going to start a career now, expect your balance to be unbalanced for at least the first six to eight months until you actually get into this is what I do, and this is how I do it. Uh, and you will create your own system at some point, but it, it takes time to understand where you are, and what you're doing, and how you want to do it. Thank you, Andres. Uh, any of the other panelists would like to add anything for this one? If not, we uh, have another question from the audience, and it's very specific. Uh, so. It's about workout as a big picture, uh, but the question basically says, since it's well accepted that health and exercise improves productivity and concentration, uh, making you more efficient when you work, how do you uh, internalize and prioritize it at the right place? Um, which means how to invest in workout in order to work more without guilt. So for panelists, so basically, to our balance, how do you guys balance your workouts to help your mental health and to help your productivity and workflow with your actual work? Is he talking about during work hours? No, I think it's in general. Like, how do you how do you balance your your workout with with your life? Like, if for example, like. Do you, can you take an hour a day, an hour every two days, an hour every four days? It doesn't have to be during work hours. It can be at night, I think. And, and do a workout, which makes you feel better about yourself and then can be more productive at work. Yes, here is my best solution. Commit to other activities. Every day after work, that's why I have to step up four, because then I have two hours, whether it's tennis or golf or um, group. I won't say what type of activities, but it's kind of group exercise for fun. So if you commit that and pay for it, you have to show up there. So that will give you a good hard stop and then move on. And then you can come back if you want to, but it's a good refresh. Any of the other panelists? I can try to uh, share my input. So one thing I do, which I'm doing right now, I, I'm standing. So that's what I try to do at work. It's for a few hours every day, I can, if I can stand. <laughs> uh, so I think getting a standing desk is, is helpful uh, for my, I, I think for my health. And I think regarding the, the workout and the gym, I really agree with Summer. I think, you know, if you get into some activities, so I play sometimes tennis. 
and then you know you just make a schedule for for playing tennis and then uh, you get that workout and if it's going to the gym i think blocking that uh, time i think initially it looks very hard to do it but then once if if you put in the time for it it really pays off because uh, yeah the physical health and the mental health go hand in hand i i think kela can relate uh my job is my workout um you spend your whole day playing with ladders moving rods checking rebar uh running from the concrete truck so you don't get run over uh running from the bulldozer uh, that type of things you know normal everyday things that everybody does i mean who doesn't run from a bulldozer um you try to run and tell the operators hey stop you're going to run over my concrete cylinders um that type of things keep you uh in shape uh but in general i i usually try to take at least 10 minutes at night and, and try to do something for myself uh just to keep you know my muscles stretch and stuff uh because you're going to need it the other day but in general when you work in the field expect to get home and sit that's what you want to do um so so yeah I, your part of your job if you're in the field will become your workout sure and, uh, and i can i can build off of that too i mean depending on the size of your job i mean you're walking up and down 12 flights of stairs five times a day you're walking five to six miles a day just trying to get from point a to point b and running around um so for me the biggest thing is finding time to do yoga every day whether that's five minutes of stretching in the morning and then when i get home uh i like to do classes on the weekends like 30 60 minute classes on saturdays and sundays to just kind of stretch out and just kind of release the stress from the week yeah and and if you are a parent your kids use your workout so you finish work and you work out with your kids and you go to sleep okay <laughs> Um, next one, uh, will be, have you ever felt burnout? And if so, how did you manage that? Uh, so we'll start with Alvaro with this one. Sure. <clears throat> one of the moments that I actually felt more burned out was during my, my PhD other than doing work. That's the last three months where I was writing my, my dissertation, it was pretty, pretty busy. And it just was that time when the coronavirus started. So it was, it was a, it was a mess, but I, I, I made it happen. And I made it happen in, in a big uh, reason because of, of the workout or workout that I was doing every day. I mean, I, I yoga a lot. I play tennis, golf a lot. And I socialize quite a lot. So that's the things that, that keep me motivated and excited to, to keep going. But Kila, I think I was muted. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, so I have absolutely felt burnout. When I was in college, when I first started in my career, it just feels exhausting. And I'm sure a lot of the people on this call have also felt burned out at some point in their lives. Um, so in the work environment, what I've learned is to really pay attention to your manager. Um, if your manager is really in tune to what you're doing, then they'll notice things. They'll notice that your quality of work isn't great. They'll notice that you're snappy with them and you're stressed out. Um, but there's other managers that don't really see that because they're a higher level, they're managing multiple people. So to kind of mitigate and nip it in the bud, so to speak, your burned out phase, just have an open and honest conversation with your manager. Let them know that you have too much on your plate. Try to talk to them and find a way to divide and conquer and find that time so that you don't get burned out because at that point you're almost worthless right your quality of work isn't great your mental health isn't great you're you're eating crap food and it's just all around not a bad situation to be in so just being open and honest and upfront about it before it happens is the best way that i've found to mitigate it great answer Kima. thank you um so the next question is from the audience and i can relate to the question by the way uh some job need travel 
how do you balance job and life with that special uh with like if you have, if you're newly married or have kids um so i don't know if any of you relate to this one but i personally do i i travel i work heavily and my wife work and travel too and we have two kids so i think the quick answer it's tough you can manage i'm not going to expand on it <laughs> Uh, so I will move to our panelists if we have a, an answer for this. Now I'm going to answer just in general. For me, I love travel. The last year and a half, it was, yeah. Um, so I usually, let's say if I go do a workshop or presentation or a job site, it will take probably usually three days or four days. And then if it hits the weekend, I will extend my stay on my expense and just enjoy wherever I am. By now I went to almost most of, of the states throughout. So it's kind of, you are traveling, you're already there, get your job done. And then if you still have the weekend, just enjoy your time and come back. It's just half vacation. Any more, uh, more balance? I, I think uh, it will depend on your scope. Uh, sometimes in my case, I try to do uh, the same kind of enjoy where I'm at, but there are some jobs that it's uh, going in, get out, done. Uh, and sometimes you don't have that extra time to do it. Um, it takes a lot of pre-planning, uh, especially if you have added responsibilities like kids or pets or, or partners or whatever. Um, in my case, I don't have any of those. So when my boss says, hey, there is an out of state job, I'm like, I'm in. Um, so I pack it up and go. Uh, but it, it takes a little bit of planning and make sure everything is in order before you leave. And, and as Kayla mentioned before, talk to your manager and say, hey, um, I can only do this once a month or I can only do this twice a month or, hey, I'm on call. I don't mind. I don't care. Um, but it, it is a conversation to have, uh, especially if you have those added responsibilities. Yes. Yeah, so so what I think it's very specific. So I, I personally I'm in this situation, so I, maybe I can expand a little bit. So I think the main thing that works out for me is communication. Like you have to communicate with your spouse and you both have to understand like these added responsibilities. One of my kids is older too, she's nine. So now she's like, why are you traveling? So you need to also explain that to your, your kids as well. Uh, if you love what you do, you will manage and find ways to do it. And thankfully this is the case for me, like I love my job basically uh, like we work in consulting so it's a new thing every day and it's kind of fun to travel and see a project and try to solve a problem in the field um sometimes you can feel burnout or you can feel like oh that's too much uh but this is where the communication with your management to uh can come in uh so, I, have, I have one quick comment um i know at some point something about go talk to your manager I wouldn't do that right away because the more good job you're doing, the more assignment they will give you. I would just ask the question, when is the deadline for this? That usually they will go, oh yeah, that's fine. You can take a couple of weeks. So that will be, um, that will be good response for managers. So um, that's just my comment. Okay, great. Um... So we have more questions from the audience. I think we can go through these first. And um, uh, like disclosure for the attendees, I will have to uh, to leave. So Lauren and, and, and Daniela will uh, take over. Uh, so what do you guys think of moving to a home close to the office? If round trip commute time takes an hour or two every day, I feel that could hurt your work-life balance. Uh, again, great question. Uh, this is what we eventually did. We moved five minutes from the office. Uh, but our panelists, I think it's a good answer. It's a good question. Um, I actually, I just did that recently. I was living in Michigan, but then I got a new job. So I moved six minutes from the office just because I don't want to drive back and forth and I'm spending most of my time over there. So I'm here right now and then I can travel to Chicago in the weekends if I want to. But yeah, I, I really think it's a good idea. You don't want to burn yourself out for a whole hour in the morning and afternoon. So, I'll add to it. I mean, 
when I first started, I moved pretty close to like the main office and then very, very quickly realized that I was never there. Um, so, um, for the construction industry, like find a place to live that you like, find a place that you are comfortable and you want to grow and get married and have kids and make family. Um, because sometimes you'll be lucky and your job site will be 15 minutes away. Other times it'll take an hour. I mean, it just kind of depends. You can't, you can't live your life based on like moving every year or every two years just to be close to a project in like me and Andrea's case, it just, you're always moving around. So it's just kind of part of the gig, which makes it really cool. In my opinion, you get to see something new every year. You're not stuck in an office. Yeah, I wanted to add that it's true. I mean, uh, when I first started, I was like 15 minutes away from the office. Uh, when we started breaking cylinders at 2 a.m. for a maturity mix, who's the closest one? Ha <laughs> ha, me, no, that doesn't work this way. So I quickly realized it was uh, not the best idea, um, but it, it, is, it is not too bad because everything is new to you and you just want to do something different and you're kind of like into it, like, ooh, I can do this. Um, but I, I actually, I just moved. I was 15 minutes away from my office and now I'm 40. Uh, and someone might think, oh, wow, that's a big difference. Yeah, but you have to think of your quality of life, uh, how peaceful the neighborhood is. And, and uh, Chicago, it's nice. It's a beautiful city until you get out of the city. Um, and you can just check news for it. So it, it is, as Stella said, you need to find your place, somewhere that you can go and work stays outside. And, and you can relax and be with your family, with your pets, with whoever, even if it's you and a show that you like to get to watch. Uh, but it, it will come the time that you just want to be by yourself and be peaceful because we literally get paid to fix other people's problems. That's what we do for a living. So you just want to have time for not deal with problems. Uh, and yeah, it, the time is not the problem. It is how comfortable you feel in that place. And that will determine where you go. That's an excellent question, by the way. That's a really good question. All right, good input, everybody. We've got another question from the audience. And this one, you know, the last 18 months we've been living in this pandemic world. So to our panelists, how are you guys keeping yourself motivated, especially during this pandemic time right now? I can get this one, especially because I started my job during the pandemic. So I've been working from home the last couple of years, year and a half, and I keep doing it. And to be honest, at the beginning, I thought, well, it's pretty interesting because I don't have to commute and I, I can use my time just to work and then do whatever I want. But at some point, it gets also a little bit frustrating because you are in the same place that you have lunch and you sleep. And so it gets pretty, you feel like you are in a box. So what I try to do, and that's what I did, like relating to the previous uh, question is I moved to a place that it's, that it's nice. I'm here in Miami, ocean view, something that it motivates me at least because I'm, since I'm in my apartment the entire day, then it, it keeps me at least a little happy and good, with good views. I would love an ocean view right now. Does anybody else in our panel team have any response to that? How are you guys making it through the pandemic and balancing your life? I try to sit in my house office and lock my door and commit to the actual eight hours. But the minute my office opened, which was last July, I was the first time who showed up in the office. I still like leaving my house, getting eight hours, seeing other people and then leave for the day. Yeah, for some reason, um, good or bad, um, I work from home like, five days, maybe, when the pandemic hits. Um, most of the uh, our clients were doing design work. So since they were not able to do much outside, they switched to do the geotech investigation. So I spent most of the pandemic in the middle of a field when I'm here and the next person is like 16 acres down the street um, drilling. So it was kind of like everything was different every day because you didn't know when the jobs that you were at was going to be shut down. 
So you start your morning like, okay, we're going to check the, you know, 40 story high rise building. And then suddenly somebody sneezed in the second floor and they shut down the whole thing. And then you move over to a driveway or, or a tunnel or a bridge. So it was really interesting. And it was always like, Ooh, is this job infected? And it was kind of like a guess of, are we going to work or not? And, and it, it was dangerous. Yes. But it was kind of like, let's see what, how it goes today. And, and, and thankfully we were able to make it all the way and everything was fine. Um, my biggest motivation was what now? Like I, I get to the office, I'm beating a job and I'm like, is this going to move forward? Uh, where is this business going to? Uh, do we need to find other uh, niches in the, in, the, in the city? Like we do mostly high rises, but should we switch gears into infrastructure? Should we move into residential? And, and that kind of trying to see where our business area was going, it was really, really motivating to, okay, this is how we're going to beat the jobs now on, uh, just to make sure we can cover and changing your proposals, that type of things of how my work will change. That kept me motivated for a long, long time during the, during the pandemic. Just a comment on the residential. I worked on buildings versus residential. Residential take the same work, but kind of less in reward. All right, thanks everybody, that was a good discussion. So we have another question from the audience and this one might blend with a couple of other questions, but do any of our panelists have some routines that help keep you guys balanced with your work life and your home life? I obviously have an answer because I always have an answer for everything, but I want to, to hear in a chant because I've been talking too much, so I'm going to be the last one. Um, so one routine that I do when I'm feeling not so motivated is that I have this playlist of motivational songs. I just hear it in the morning. Um, and, and it's amazing in five, 10 minutes, I'm feeling different. <laughs> so I think, uh, having a good playlist, um, having this, uh, right set of songs to listen to is very helpful for me. Um, that's what I've found. I like that. Do any of our other panelists have a routine that they try to stick to during the week to keep themselves balanced? I try. Uh, again, you said try, not do. So <laughs> <laughs> in general, I try to get all my uh, inspector's reports uh, like on Mondays. For the past three Mondays, I haven't, but I try. Um, so I try to do that all the paperwork, boring stuff uh, early in the week so I can enjoy the rest. Um, and then I, I try to, you know, take a couple breaks here and there and talk to my coworkers and see that how everything is going. Um, and that just walking around and talking to people helped me kind of like come back to my uh, acceptable level of uh, stress. Um, and, and that's usually what I do. And then, well, Sundays and Saturdays are for me and doing my hobbies and stuff. And that helped me balance the rest of the week. Um, for me, I do a lot of artwork. So I have canvases and then I use whether it's acrylic or, or paint or ink paint. Um, I think those really good, just quiet your mind, focus on your art because it usually takes several hours and several days. So, and by the way, they are listed on ACI Women Auction. So if you don't mind, go and buy them. They are under my name. So you can participate and help people in the industry. So that was a plug for our Women of ACI auction that's happening for the next couple of days. So Samar's got some artwork there. And I'm sure several other people do too. So make sure you guys check that out as well. Yes, there are other artists, but buy my, on my art arts, they are all good. All right, thanks everyone. So let's get back to the questions. Um, so this one, I'm going to start with you, Alvaro. What would you consider a good work-life balance? Well, I think this is something very personal, right? I mean, I'm a very outgoing person, I would say. I need a lot of social life. I, I need to be with, with my friends and, and interact and meet new people. 
I also do quite a lot of sports. So I try to prioritize that. I, every day I do something with friends or I go, I, we do a dinner or we, we go play tennis or, or, or something like that. So for me, that's a good balance. And another thing that I like a lot is, is traveling. So I, I try to travel quite a lot during the weekends. So that's, that's how I keep my, my motivation level up. Because the rest of the day, of course, you need to, you need to keep answering emails and, and all those not that interesting things. Unfortunately, yes. Andres, do you have anything to add to this one? Whatever you consider good work-life balance? Yeah, I, I, as Alvaro said, it, it is a very, very personal question and, and it's a very personal answer uh, for someone that have kids. It, it, being with the kids might be super important and, and it will be part of that balance. Uh, in my case, I, I like to get my things done um, so I don't have to worry about it. And then in my free time, I really like to read or put models together or paint or, or cast concrete stuff that shouldn't be made out of concrete. But I do it because I can. Um, so it, it is part of what helps you be relaxed and happy and eager to go back to work. And, and it is a very it is a gray area. And it's something that you have to find out by yourself with time. Um, obviously, key things to note is that you don't leave to work. You work to leave. And, and in that sense, you need to keep, you, you need to be careful. And okay, at, at some point, I'm working too much. At some point, I'm doing too much. And, and when that moment comes, it's time for you to stop and say, okay, this Friday, I'm going to work until 2 p.m., and I'm going to go home and I'm going to meet my friends somewhere. Uh, even though if it's just sitting down and, and just talking to them, having a few bites or something, do it. And if you're the kind of person that just moved to a new town and you don't know anyone, try to get involved. But check your ACI local, check your ASCE local or uh, your geotech institute, whatever. Just join this professional association that give you that opportunity to know people and, and try to you know, stay, stay, you know, social. Uh, I'm like Alvaro, I'm very social. I'm shy, but people think I'm social. Um, and I'm solar powered. So I need to be outside. I, I, I'm solar powered. I, I, when it's too dark, I'm like, ah. Uh, so I, I really like to be out and, and enjoy the, the environment. So if you're that kind of person, find a trail, take a walk, take a hike. And, and those are the things that will help you balance. Like, the idea for me, the main factor is when I do these personal activities, when I finish, I, I have this sense of, yeah, it, it was it was worth wait, working 40 hours a week so I can have this precious moment for me. Uh, and that's where the line goes. Like, okay, I work my hours. Now I am able to do this. Uh, if that's racing a car, if that's going to space, whatever it is, make those work hours worth it. Uh, yes, I got my work done and I did this. This is what I wanted. And, and that's where your balance will be. And keep in mind, your balance will change as your life changes. Uh, in this stage of my life, for me, it's more important to sleep than go partying. So it, it will change uh, as long as uh, you keep growing. I mean, if there is a party, let me know. But uh, it will change. Your, your balance will be shifting uh, as you keep growing so, and getting old. So it's part of it. I'll ask the next question. Um, so what is something that surprised you about how your work life versus school life balance were different uh, between when you were in university to when you were uh, starting out your career? Um, Samar, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I went to school two times. So the first one, it was for my bachelor in civil structural engineering. And by now I can't complain. I was, comp I can't imagine. Well, it doesn't make sense to me that I was complaining then because it was just go to school, go with your friends even after after school, and that's it. That's all you need to do other than going to sites for for the engineering courses. But then after, I don't know, 10 years in the field, I went in to get my master in engineering management with creative construction management. But that was the most challenging part because I had a full-time job with a lot of trouble. And at some point, I had to take eight courses 
which was unrealistic, but I had to get it done. I had to graduate that year. So I will, I will done with the whole thing. So it's different because you need to get more things done versus if you just have a clear mind that when you first get into your bachelor or something, and then all you need to do is just get good grades. But then the more responsibilities you have, the, the more harder to balance anything. It was that specific years or two years that graduate within two years and work was a priority. So there wasn't really any time to balance anything. But you need to get them done anyway, get them done and then enjoy your life after. Andres, how about you? Um, well, the most surprising thing is that I can change the deadlines. Um, so I, I'm able to say, no, this will be ready this moment. And, and from school, you, you don't have that flexibility. It's like, oh, that's due tomorrow. It's due tomorrow. You don't send it. You get an app, period. There is no discussion. There is no working around it. And now in, in this point, for me, that was awesome that I was able to move it. Not because I procrastinate, but because I, as they say, devil is in the details. And I, I like to take care of those details. So that takes extra time. So seeing that I was able to, okay, let's coordinate the deadline. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Uh, but in general, you have the flexibility of moving stuff and, and deciding what goes first, what goes second, what goes third. And, and that for me was very surprising and very, uh, it was a good feeling of, okay, I'm not necessarily late. Um, it's just that we can work around that. And for me, that was the main thing. I'm like, this is awesome. I can push this a little bit forward or push it backwards. And that flexibility was awesome for me. Uh, something that I didn't have while I was in college. Um, and being able to talk through things. In college, you don't, you don't necessarily have that experience uh, because this is the assignment and everything is in the paper and do whatever. I mean, they gave you everything. You just need to calculate. In here, that sense of finding out stuff, it was like a, every project was like a little discovery. And it was awesome. It was really awesome. So uh, for me, that was the main thing. All right, so this next one's for Samar. Can you tell us about some tips or apps or tools that you have that help you manage your time while at work and help you with that work-life balance? Yeah, sure. So we are talking about balance in general and part of balance is getting things done. For work, usually it, it laid out what things need to be done and what deadlines for it. For, for personal life, it's more of get what you want done or what you prioritize done. So prioritize things is really essential, whether it's for work or for you. For work is usually what whether it's deadline when when you have a deadline, then you need to do it. For me, having a calendar, whether it's Google, well, try not to have two, one personal, one work. Try to use your work calendar because sometimes I have meetings after hours. And then when you have a personal thing, you can just mark it as busy and then have details only for yourself. But having a calendar laying out what you have during that week will help a lot. I, I use a lot of um, notepads. So during the weekend, that's where I have some free times. So I will list things, whether it's calls, whether it's I do some um, calls for my parents' medical stuff. So I will put those in, just have a list of pads and then get them done during the week and just throw them out and then start the next week if I have something else. So it's kind of prior because you can't get everything done, but you need to pay attention to what is important for you in the short term, at least. Um, so I think that that was really helpful to, to prioritize your time. Very nice. Um, we'll do, uh, we'll kind of switch back and forth between audience questions and the questions that we had before, but um, this one's from the audience. Among everything, what is the most important thing this pandemic brought to help you now? Uh, does anybody have any specific items they'd like to talk about there? The main thing I got is it's good to have family time, but sometimes it's just too much family time. Well, yeah, it's it it gives the it it gives that thing of it's good to go back to work in general. It's good to meet other people and talk to them. So I'll add to that. Um, one thing that I learned when 
everything first started at my previous company, we split all of our project teams in half. Uh, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you'd be on site. Tuesday, Thursday, you'd work from home and vice versa. That way, if one person got sick, the entire project team wasn't wiped out in quarantine. Uh, so what the pandemic has taught me is that I can work from home. Like it is something that is beneficial and can be done uh, even on the construction side of things. So even just taking one day a month and catching up on all that paperwork that you never have time to do because you're on site and it gets crazy uh, and setting up a little home office. So it, it's giving me that perspective that it's possible and it is beneficial. I would hate to do it every single day. Alvaro, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> but for the construction world, it is good to have that one day a month to really just hammer out the rest of those details. Yeah, I, I, I think for me, the main, the main thing out of the pandemic was to not be so focus on one thing, like being able to understand other areas of your work and, and understand what your coworkers do. Um, that was really beneficial. Uh, for example, I'm a concrete person. Uh, that's, that's what I do. That's what I love. Um, I work as a geotech, but I was, uh, I needed to learn about steel and welding and bolting and high strength bolting, because if something happens and, and I get this job and, and, my coworker is sick or he can come in or whatever, he's quarantined, who's going to handle the client? So it, it taught me to not be so centered in what I do and be able to expand a little bit and, and, and try to understand what other people in my office do. Um, I don't know anything about roofing, but I have to, you know, talk to the person that does the roofing and he was very nice. He explained everything. The same thing I did at Geotech. I explained him, hey, this is what we do for Geotech. So in that sense, you're able to at least serve that client and, and hold it enough time for the other person to come in and, and fix it and finish the job. So uh, the main thing for me was to learn a little bit of everything the company does. So you're able to provide the service to your clients. That was the main thing for me. All right. Thanks everyone. So Keila, coming back to you, do you feel like you ever used to feel bad about something like missing something with your friends or family or using sick leave um, that you've now been able to kind of balance a little bit better and work around? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll start with sick time. Uh, when I first started in my career, I felt like I couldn't take sick time. I couldn't leave the team hanging. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be away from the job and I had to be there. Uh, but as I grew in my career, I started realizing showing up to work at only 50% capacity, right? If you're sick or something's going on at home that you're focused on, um, you're really not being a benefit to the team if you're only at 50%. So taking that one, two days at home, shutting down, recover and come back ready to slam in some work like that time is worth it. And I used to think that people look down at you if you took sick time, right? Of like, why aren't you not here, right? But you realize it's just life. I mean, nobody cares, really, unless you're taking like five sick days every single month. Like, then there's a problem. But if, it, if, you, if you're actually sick, like, take the time, recover, get well. You have to prioritize yourself and your health over everything, right? And that way you can actually be beneficial and be a good team player. Uh, same goes with personal days or vacation days. Um, it's good to take at least like one personal day a year where you go get a teeth clean, get, you know, acupuncture or whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, but that's what I like to do is take one day, cram all of that into one day, uh, get my physical, all of that. And it's like a mental health day. Right? and a wellness day, and it's good for you. You should do it. Take the time. It's worth it. Keila says one day a year. I think more than that, but, you know, that's our balance. But, yeah, I definitely agree. Samar, do you have anything to add to that? 
I think Kayla's suggestion is really good. I've never tried it. I've never took sick time, but I usually try to schedule my uh, appointment after work or during the weekend. But that's a really good thing. And yeah, I've, I've never showed up to work sick. It's either just I will work from home, so I, I'm on I, my own pace, or just take a vacation. I wasn't thinking about this sick thing. But yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Thank you, Kayla. Okay. Um, so Nishant, uh, do you ever feel like uh, balance changes at all? Or have you managed uh, for your balance to remain the same throughout your career? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think, I think the balance uh, definitely changes uh, as you um, I think it's, it's, I guess it has to do with somewhat uh, with the career, but also I think it's also with your kind of life, you know, you can say, uh, you know, I was a student, I was on my own, I was, you know, it's a single, then I can just work, work, you know, all the time, I don't have any responsibilities, you know, as, as you reach a stage of life, then, you know, so I'm married, I have kids, then I have to, you know, uh, that that's part of my life now. So I think that definitely uh, changes over time. Um, in terms of career, I think one thing um, I would say, as you, I guess, uh, move farther in your career, you do get more and more flexibility of how you wanna spend your time, uh, which I think is really, really um, good. And I really appreciate that. Uh, I have the freedom to, whenever I want to work, I can I can work. Of course there are, there will always be things which are fixed, uh, but the more flexibility you have, and then the more you can choose things that you enjoy doing, then it doesn't feel like you know, you're doing kind of work. You're kind of enjoying uh, as you're doing those things. Absolutely. Um, Samar, what about you? Um, do you feel like your balance has pretty much stayed the same or has it kind of evolved as your career has? Of course not. <laughs> so when I first started, it was construction slash um, oversight. So I was in the job site all the time. Exactly the the um, the schedule of you are on the job site all the time until they are done or at least until it's dark. Um, but then when you actually add it to it, school and more courses you have to take and some license you have to take, it's more of tilt toward your professional and advance your professional career. Now, I don't think it's unbalanced. I think it's still a good thing to focus on something, get it done, and then move on. Um, but yeah, you can't maintain it all the time. It's kind of something just shift priority, get things done, and then move on to a whole different thing. Um, but it's, it's based on what you consider your target or what you consider your priority or what you need to get done. I agree. So we have another question from the audience and I think everyone on our panel will have maybe a different idea for this one, but how are you guys setting your priorities and doing it effectively? And is there a general way that you choose, you know, what's at the top of the list? What can wait until a little bit later? I know we all have different jobs, but for our panelists, how are you guys setting your priorities? So I'll go first. Um, I guess when you first start out, you really don't know what's priority and it feels like everything's on fire and everything's going to explode if you don't do everything all at once. Um, but as you start to really feel things out, you start to find your own priorities and what actually is important for the job. Um, so you kind of figure it out on your own. Uh, my main thing is to come into work when I first start the day and find those top like three things that I have to do today. Like there's no option. I have to get them done today. Um, Cause the, the main key thing is if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. So you have to set those boundaries for yourself and understand what those priorities are from your team and for the job. I yeah, agree. I, I agree. Andres, yeah. anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it will depend on, on what you're doing and, and what your scope is. Uh, in my case, I in the mornings, I try to get out those things that I don't want to do. Um, whatever I hate the most, that's the first thing I do. 
uh, because then I can enjoy the rest of my day doing what I like, what I want to do. Um, and, and many factors will decide what you consider a priority. For example, it can be a client. It can be a small job, but you know that client is very constant and they pay well and, and they are your main client all the time. So you might want to take care of them first. Or you have this client that doesn't always call you, but when they call, it's a big job. And, and those type of things will, or, or this client is uh, your boss friend, or, or this client is your friend, and you're like, hey, I need to take care of my friend first. And those type of details will switch how you prioritize your day, and it will, I think it will be on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, and some days you get this cool project that uh, you, you actually want to do, and you're like, you know what? Everyone can wait because I want to do this. Um, and, and it's... It happens. Sometimes I'm in the office and I'm eager to do my reports. And then my boss comes in and say, hey, do you want to go and check a concrete plan? Of course I want to. Let's go. Get in the car. So you just take your car and leave. And, and then what about the report? Well, well, I guess it was not a priority. So it is, it is you're, you're going to find your balance. Um, in that sense, I'm kind of on balance. If uh, I learned something at the GI uh, the ASCE Geotechnical Institute, uh, a good friend, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, he said, any bad day in the field is better than any good day in the office. So if I'm in the office and I'm doing a report and you come in and say, hey, we're going to check out this project, I'm in, I'm driving, and then we stop for lunch. So your, your priorities will shift as your interests shift and as your career progresses, and, and that will define what your priority is and it will be a day by day basis. So, well, that's that sounds great. Um, so, just a reminder too, since we're about at the halfway mark, that this uh, session does not have any PDH credits, so we don't have anything to show. Um, just uh, another announcement to the um, attendees. Um, our next question: Does having a good work life balance affect your performance? Um, Keila, you want to start that one off? Sure. I mean, it, it absolutely does. If you're devoting all of your time to your job, then your mental health suffers and your physical health suffers and everything else kind of falls apart in the process. I mean, it makes you stressed out and then you're stressed out at work and it just kind of spirals out of control. So having that work-life balance and figuring it out for yourself, it makes you a better performer at work. And it also makes you better in your life. I mean, it makes you happier. It makes you feel more successful and more valued. So prioritizing that balance and finding what that groove is for you will make you better at work and in your home life. Absolutely. Nishant, how about you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, if I talk specifically, like, you know, if I have a weekend where I'm just, you know, working, 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 uh, and I have no fun time, uh, I'll feel very bad on Monday. You know, I'll feel like I didn't have my, you know, weekend. So even though I did some work on the weekend, but then on Monday, my efficiency is really low. You know, my productivity is really low. So what I find out is, is unless, of course, you know, something is on fire, there's a great deadline, it's better to take that time to just completely, you know, um, uh, kind of enjoy sometime and then on Monday I come back with this kind of guilt oh I you know <laughs> enjoy it on the weekend now I have to work so it's um, uh, but if I don't do that then my Monday is horrible so all right thanks guys so the next question this one's going to be a two-parter so get ready um, first of all how do you guys handle when you have really big requests from your clients or from your supervisors if they're going to maybe throw off your balance a little bit. And with that, is there a way that you can ask your supervisors or clients or encourage them to respect your balance in your work life? So um, let's start with Andres for that one. Yeah, I, I think that's a very recurring topic uh, that happens every day because everyone wants everything for now. And all of your clients think that they are your only client. Um, so it's a matter of managing expectations and sometimes you have to be polite about it and it takes a lot of uh, personal skill interpersonal skills to deal with someone and say hey you need to stop requesting tests 
within 24 hours when the ASTM says you need 48. So it's a matter of what you say and how you say it. Uh, and I have one of those that we pick up the sample today and they want the 28 day break tomorrow. It's called 28 day break for some reason. So it is a matter of educating your client and be able to convey those explanations and say, hey, um, this is the time frame we're looking at and setting those boundaries first saying, hey, we're doing this for you. You're paying me for it. This is the time frame. We need to commit to this time frame. Um, if you move or you change your schedule or you change your operations, you need to let me know. Otherwise, we're going to stick to this time frame and be firm about it. When they call and say, hey, we need that. I'm like, no, you don't. You, you change it. You didn't tell me there is a lack of communication. We need to address that first and then manage when you're going to get results. Um, sometimes you need to make exceptions because when you look at the numbers and when you look at the type of client and sometimes we have very good clients that they are friends and they, they call their friends of the company and they call like, hey, I have a problem. Uh, one of my subcontractors messed something up or we did something wrong or somebody put retarder in the concrete instead of super P and those are bad. <laughs> Just take the truck out. But um, it, it's sometimes you do that type of work and say, okay, don't worry, I'll be there. And, and those are things you do, but you need to manage and, and talk to them like, hey, I'm doing this, but you do know that this will be accompanied of, hey, this type of billing or, or this type of, uh, you owe me this one or take me to the Black Hawk team or, or you know, you talk about it. And, and it's a matter, I think the main line will be establishing a good communication with those person expecting something from you, either clients or managers or your boss or your friends. And that will save you a lot of trouble and a lot of time uh, down the line. So if you manage those expectations right off the bat, you'll be fine. It's like training a puppy. It's the same thing as training a puppy. You need to make sure the puppy knows where he's going. And the moment you do that, you will not have any issues with the puppy when it grows. But if you don't manage those expectations first, you will have a lot of issues down the line, so. Alvaro, do you have anything to add to that? Do you think it's like training a puppy or do you find it a little bit more difficult? No, I think I think like most of the things that Andres said makes a lot of sense. Sometimes it, it gets a little hard as, as he said. And I think it's, it's really important to be transparent, to create expectations, the ones that you can meet, but especially to meet those expectations and be realistic because if you are with a client and you tell him, okay, I'm going to send you this in a week and you don't do it. And then the next time you do the same thing, then they are going to get pissed off and then they are going to be after you the entire day. If you create realistic expectations, then they are, they are going to be more calm. One of the things that it, it is a little harder for me, it's since I did my PhD not that long ago, a year and a half ago, my advisor from the university keeps also being after me for other publications and, and, and other work that we left from, from the university. So that, that is also pretty tricky because since I've been working for him for four years, he sometimes thinks that I'm still working for him, but I'm not, I'm in another job. So trying to keep calm both parts, it's, it's sometimes, Interesting, but you, you get there. Right. Absolutely. Um, so this, this question kind of goes hand in hand as well. Um, how do you encourage your clients and supervisors to respect your work time versus your life time? Um, uh, Andres? The, we, Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It will be, I don't know. This is complicated. What was the question? Just encouraging your clients and supervised, supervisors to request that time, that uh, to respect your time off. Uh, I, 
obviously it goes hand to hand with communication and, and setting those boundaries. Uh, but sometimes you need to strong arm people into respecting that because at the end of the day, as Kayla was mentioning, if you're not healthy, you can't do anything because you will be lying on bed or, or you know, on the ground or under the ground, which is even worse. So it, it, it is a matter of being persuasive. And I had a client that he likes to call Saturdays at 3 p.m. for stuff. And no, it doesn't work that way. So I was kind, I was nice, I was polite. And last time I sent them the bill for expedite reporting of hours. And I keep adding to that bill. So he learned his lesson. I had to strong arm it. It's, you have the tools, you need to understand that as an engineer or, or as a professional in the, in the construction industry, you have some leverage of how the construction work goes. Um, I don't like to do that, but it was a recurring issue. Some people understand and some people call and the first thing they say, hey, I don't want to bother you, but this is an emergency. And those you have to take it. There is no, there is no much around it. Um, but it will be a matter of, hey, I, if it's your boss, for example, it's like, hey, I had a rough week. I'm really tired. Um, I'm going to leave early on Friday. I'll be back Monday. Uh, just call me if, if, a big if, uh, it's an emergency. Uh, otherwise, just let me rest so I can come back and be productive as, as usual. Um, but with the client, you have to be really careful and really polite and really nice to them because at the end of the day, they pay your salary. So you don't want to piss them off, but you want to train the puppy, basically. So uh, you want to make sure they understand the limitations. And, and that's something I started adding to my proposals. Like if I send a proposal out, I added like, hey, I don't mind. I will take your call. But on Saturdays, this is the rate. And Sundays, this is the rate. And be able to convey that in a nice and polite way. And, and that seems to be working out perfectly fine with them. So they haven't called yet. So it's working. No, that sounds that's a good a good uh, method. I, I have a comment. Oh, yeah. So um, just in general, the main reason people call you after hours is because they have something that you have that they need, whether it's clarification or any update, or they think that's the only important thing in the whole world. And that's typical because it's it's their own project or their own deadline. What I found helpful is not even send an email, but give them a call saying, all right, here is here is the update. Here is what it is, because they are not getting it back because there is a really good reason for it. It's not like you are hiding it because you are done with your eight hours work. So I usually, especially I get a lot of um, like code interpretation on, on specific projects. So they give me the actual project and then um, most of the time contractor mess things up and then you have to somehow justify it um so it's it's obvious all right w you just get us the full drone so we need to, time to review it and then they get formal response with with all the um deficiency in, in, in it so it's it's more of communicate back if if you know somebody's gonna call you if he didn't get anything back just call them saying here's where i'm right now i'm not, i'm still working on it and it won't be ready until two days later or tomorrow at least by the end of the day. So as long as you communicate, you'll keep them away from your free time. Absolutely. Um, Alvaro, do you have anything to add to it or? I think it's pretty much what they said. I mean, in my case, being working remotely, I think sometimes you need to be pretty strategic and, and intelligent. How do you communicate with, with people, with your boss, with your clients? You kind of, need to be firm on what is your schedule and and keep keep them posted i mean if if there is someone that it's bothering you then you tell him or her again that it's you are doing some other things and it's it, it's life and and sometimes if, if you need to pretend you are busy with another project and you need to put that as an excuse because they keep bothering you then you do it and that's that's how it goes i think we all do that and Sometimes it's not the, the best way or the most transparent way, but if there is someone that doesn't learn the lesson and keeps doing it, then it's, it's what it is.
All right, thanks everybody. So the next question, I know a few of our panelists have been working from home for at least some or all of the pandemic over the last year and a half. So how are you guys able to draw the line on what is work and then what is life after work when you're in the same location? So Samar, do you wanna start us off with that one? Um, yeah, sure. So having a work, um, a home office will help a lot. Just close your door, focus on your work because whether wherever you are, you need to get things done, especially when you have deadlines. So try to do that. And then at some point, especially at, at home, the work hour is going to extend at some point because I work with people over, overseas or something. So since I'm at home, sure, I can have meetings or presentation um, late at night, so I can do that. But um, that's why I jumped right back to the office because it gives me good balance in general. Alvaro, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. I think I mean, the strategy that I follow is, since I have some friends here in Miami that, that they are in the same situation, what we do is we try to get all together and say, okay, today at this time, we are all having lunch together. Or we are going to play tennis all together. So since we are all in the same situation, we kind of force each other to get out and, and have some fun and, and kind of limit a little bit the, the work and then enjoy life because that's all it matters. That's all you can do. Does anybody else have anything to add to that one? Kind of working from home and trying to figure out what's work time and what's life time. All right. Okay. Um, so this is a question that we got from the audience. Um, uh, has anyone thought about how to adjust uh, balance later in life as approaching retirement age? Um, for example, continuing to work part time as you approach the end of your career? Well, I'm, I'm not retiring yet. I have tried twice already and HR says, no, I'm missing like 28 years or something. Just weird requirements these people have around here. I don't understand that. I have tried twice. Um, however, um, I have been very lucky to work with people that are close to retirement or are retiring. And I, what they have done is that they keep working and they are there the whole day, but they take the extra time. Let's say they work four hours in their normal things and then they take the other four or whatever to kind of talk to us, the younger people and mentor younger generations because the moment you just work and then disappear, you disappear from the industry. The moment you take that little bit of extra time and decide to mentor other people, to teach, to transmit your experiences. That's very helpful for us, the young professionals. And that's how you live longer in the concrete industry because you left that experiences and that knowledge to all of us. And, and in that sense, I think how I see my retirement, I hope it comes closer, I don't know. Uh, it is taking that extra time to transmit our experience to the younger co-workers or younger professionals because in that sense yes it takes a little bit of adjustment because things are not how they used to be but it really pays off and it really takes a lot of load off your back because the moment you start teaching those younger professionals they start helping you out and then you can uh, be able to delegate on people that you know are professionally competent to do so because you train them so I think it, it, it will be a matter, as we have been talking for, for a while, of communicating and being able to sit down with those younger professionals and say, hey, I'm just counting down. I'm getting out of here. Uh, this is what I do. Who wants to learn it? And let's go over the things that I do. Um, and that's how I see my retirement. And that's how I see, have seen people retiring uh, in my uh, work area. So. Yeah, we'll keep trying on my retirement. I let you know when I'm out, but uh, so far, HR is not buying it. Yeah, I think just from just so to kind of add to that, um, a lot of people that I work with kind of go to county work, um, so they are either an inspector that's for the county, or um, so kind of more of a, a step back from the stress of every day, but still get to use their knowledge. Um, so that seemed to be a very popular choice uh, to have more flexibility as you retire and also take advantage of um, all the knowledge that you've gotten over the years.
Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to comment. You can prepare for it way early because whether you are a civil engineer or any type of engineering, every field have different tasks you can do, whether it's job site, whether it's design, whether it's construction again or, or something. But then the more experience you have, the more field you can get as a management or something that you can manage people. But then at, when you get closer to your retirement, you can be as an expert in that field. So there are specific fields where you can be expert from your own home if you want to. I've, I've seen a lot of um, retired gentlemen who they retired, but then it's just boring to stay at home after working your whole life. That's why they went back in as an advisor. So it, you can get work as a, as an approval. I work with fire safety. So you get approval on, on fire system and buildings and, complying with the code so you can get that and then by then you can have your own hours you can have your own clients you can deal with so it's kind of if you pick the right field that will allow you to have more relaxed work while you're still working that will be a good pre-plan for it definitely i agree and andres when you figure out how to retire early you just let me know so i can hop on that train as well but uh we're gonna kind of Go to the other end of the spectrum instead of talking about retirement and end of career what recommendations and advice do you guys have for younger professionals that are maybe starting a new job moving to a new place um, and how can they maintain that balance so nishant we'll start with you yeah yeah i think in terms of advice to um young professionals uh, moving to a new uh, job or a new place would be i think the first thing would be to um, of course, you know, talk with your uh, new colleagues as well as your new um, supervisor to figure out what are the priorities, right? Because in, in any kind of jobs these days, I think we have just too many things to do. And sometimes you can end up focusing on things which are not important. And sometimes those are things that are screaming for your attention, but you don't want to do those because that's not a good use of your time. So really figuring out what will be worth your time uh, and spending your time on that is the best uh, long-term investment. And the other thing I've found over time in my career is that, you know, um, focusing on quality or quantity really um, pays off uh, uh, in the long term. So you can't do everything, but if you do a few things, but you do them well, uh, that that works out. It is it is very hard to say no, because every, people are wanting you to, you know, can you do this, do this, and you say yes to everything, but then maybe you cannot do a good job for those 20 things. Um, but if you say no to 15, just pick five, but do a good job with those five. Um, in, in the long term, it'll be good for you. I agree. Samar, do you have anything to add about maybe somebody who's a new professional working in a new place? Yeah, I wasn't actually about to go to the opposite. Um, I only talked about balance, so try to not affect your life hours in any way, but don't um, disregard any opportunity to learn new things. So. If you are in a design on concrete and that's it, if if you get an opportunity or request to work on other materials, try that because that's the more the broader your your background is, the more beneficial down the road. I worked in precast systems and retrofit and then convert to fire safety. So you get how to get systems in, building structure, it's still related to structural because you you, you need structural safety and and for fire events but it's kind of give you a new perspective of the material things that you did not get if you're just focusing on one um topic so the the broader your your topics is without affecting your life the broader your experience is the the more you'll get benefit down the road so try to be open-minded with those okay Absolutely. Um, so next question, uh, what have you advocated for, for yourself or for your peers to help you maintain work-life balance? Um, Andres, you want to start that one? Sure. Um, it is, and this is something that the pandemic, I think, show us all, is that if you don't feel well, go home. And, and that little phrase says a lot. Because before this, all of this happened, um, most of the companies were, well, I don't care. As long as you keep working, you know, uh, take some Advil and hit it. So, and this 
problem and this pandemic show us that, hey, you don't feel good, go home. For your benefit or the benefit of us all. So advocating for that and keeping that in mind, even after we finish this, I think it will be a very good improvement on your work-life balance and being able to do that. And, and it's something I have done. Like I have people in the lab that I say, hey, you don't look very good today. Uh, I don't want to be mean. I just say, hey, you, you look like you're going to get sick, so go home. And, and then go to the doctor, get checked out and call me and let me know. And, and it's the right thing to do, but it was not obvious before this. Um, the same thing with vacations. It's like, hey, you look like you need a day off. You know, and then I look in the mirror and say, like, well, you need a six month vacation twice a year. But um, it, it is a matter of paying attention. And I think paying attention to the behavior of your peers is really important in that. And, and it's something I've been doing and, and it seems to be working out. So, yeah, health is the main priority for everything. As long as you're healthy, then we can work with the rest of the things. The moment you're sick, or you're not feeling well, you're not yourself. You need to take care of that first in order to do a good work. So. Samar, how about you? Yeah, um, I can't tell people to to go somewhere, but what I usually do is just take care of their own tasks. So I usually, that their calls will transfer to my extension, so I'll be able, able to answer instead of them if they wanna leave their office. And then the same thing, I run a lot of building code action committee meetings and seismic and retrofit meetings. So I will take care of that, those with all attendees and all the structural work that's required. So it's kind of if when they decided they want, they need some time off, just offer your help. I know sometimes it will tip your balance, but it's worth it because you work as a team. So if, just help them as much as you could. It's just temporary help when they need it. I agree. Uh, okay, let's move to the next question. What are some ways that you guys have learned to be able to set boundaries? I know we've kind of hit on this a little bit, but um, how can you balance your work life and your home life and keep a balance and set boundaries? So Alvaro, I think you might've hit on this. Keila, do you wanna go for this one? Uh, sure. Uh, so to actually, set the boundaries between work and life. The, the main thing for me is leave work at work, but also in the reverse, leave home at home. Um, we mention that to our crews almost on a daily basis of, if you have stuff that you have to deal with at home, like go home and deal with it. Don't focus on that while you're on the site because that's safety hazard, right? If you're not paying attention and you're not focused on your daily tasks and what you're doing here and now, then that distracts you from what you're doing and where you're at and the safety aspect of things, right? So for me, it's really just make that clear distinction of work is at work, which means not coming home and just complaining to your spouse or you know, bringing all that baggage home with you and that stress, leave it as soon as you get in your truck. Leave it there and keep it separated because otherwise you're just going to stew on it and it's going to keep you up all night, which still happens sometimes when it's a really big fire. Um, but just try to really make that distinction of that's for me. As soon as I turn on the car, that's when I switch gears. That's my, I'm going home, it's time to think about home. And in the morning, it's time to leave all the home stuff at home and get to work and really get down to business. That's good advice. I can definitely learn from that. Does anyone else in our panel have any other thoughts on how to set boundaries and what has worked for you? Maybe some folks who are working from home and don't get that ride home to decompress? I think one boundary I set is, for example, you know, if um, I'm having a nice, you know, dinner with my family, I don't want to have the notifications on on my email, because you know, the moment you see kind of a bad email, right, a rejection letter of, of some kind of, you know, a proposal rejection, a paper rejection, it completely, you know, ruins your mood. So then I I only check my email when I when I want to when I'm ready. So you know, I open the phone, I have to go into the app, but I don't want notifications coming on the screen. 
so that's how I set, set the boundary um, between work and life. Well, it also help if you could get the list of what's required or what you need to do that specific day. By the time you are off work, you are fine. You don't need to think about anything because you get what you need done that day. Well, you can try that, but I know sometimes it doesn't work, but that's a good way of trying to avoid think about work because when you think about it, that means you, you worry about something. So if you get a response by the end of the day and you need to get it done, just call them, get some clarification. So you just end the whole worry about work aspect. One thing that I, I would like to add, and it's something that, it was not planned, but it worked out. Um, when I first moved here, um, my cell phone used to still have the uh, 787 area code, which is Puerto Rico, right? So I used to call my clients and they think it's a scam because it's a different area code or, or, or you know, so it was weird. So um, the office decided to say, hey, we're going to issue a new number with a new phone. And, and then that way it's a Chicago area code and everything should work fine. Um, and that turned out great. Because if I really need the time for me, shut it off, shut it off. And then I still have my personal phone where all my family can reach me and my friends can reach me. Uh, and, and in that sense, if you have that opportunity that the company provides that, do it. If not, do it on your own. Go to your favorite carrier and say, hey, give me a new number. And this is my number for work. And the moment you get home and you have your home time, turn it off. Because there are days I leave it on and, and sometimes I look at it and stuff, but there are days that I need the time to be with my family and do my stuff. It's in airplane mode or it's in a notification mode that, you know, only gives you the important people that you mark. And, and that helps a lot, especially if you're studying for uh, your EIT or your PE, or if you're taking your master's degree, or you really need to focus on that time, put an airplane mode. But that way, you still have your personal and you can reach out to your family and stuff if needed. So uh, that, was, that happened to me by chance, uh, but I learned a great lesson of it. And, and I think if you have that option, do it. it. It really works. Absolutely. That was a very relatable one. Um, so we've got uh, another question from the audience. Um, so as things are opening back up and office spaces are encouraging people to come back to the office, um, what will you take from the experience if you were working from home uh, through the pandemic? So I can start this one off. Um, one of the biggest things that I learned, especially on a field craft perspective of working from home and then coming back from the job and back and forth is that increased communication and how valuable that actually is. That was my biggest lesson learned of trying to figure out how to work from home is every day me and the team would have a call and just say, hey, what happened on site? I wasn't there. I'm like out of control, right? Um, so having that new, really open, more fluid communication was a huge game changer for me and my team and carrying that through to now being on site every day and everybody's here all the time, taking that, you know, new tool that was an old tool that we just never really did very well and taking that and using it as a daily thing, keeping everybody in the loop, it's made a huge difference for our work environment. Yeah, I keep adding to everything, uh, but, uh, <laughs> I'm going to add the other side of what uh, Kayla just said. It's in my case, I didn't work from home. So basically my, my work schedule didn't change that much. We just staggered everybody else in the office and, and I was in the field and it was away from everyone. But in my case, that really good tool of virtual meetings that everybody was enjoying, for me, it was a problem. Because I'm in the field, I'm trying to do something and hanging in the 90th floor of a, of a building, trying to check for flatness. And you have a Zoom call. And, and, and at that moment, it's like, well, people, you're all at home. That's fine, but I'm not. So I don't have signal or last. Well, we have a, a meeting call last time and I was by a drill rig. I had a diesel engine right in my ear and my phone in the other one trying to listen to the virtual, virtual meeting. So yeah, it's really nice when people ask when you can do this because that way you can prepare for it. And it's a really good tool. It's really amazing, but 
we need to understand that oh, not everybody is in the same situation. Um, so those are fun when you have to take those virtual meetings in the field and everybody's like, what are you doing? Well, drilling. Uh, so, but it's a really good tool and it's really nice that people are getting used to those weekly updates and that helps a lot to keep track of the projects. Okay, we can go on to number 18. Um, how do you manage your balance when you have upcoming deadlines or things that must be done immediately? Nishant, how about you want to take that one? Yeah, so, okay, so the question is um, how do you manage your balance when the upcoming deadlines or things must be done immediately? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question. Um, I think really there is just no way but to but to you know get the work done. I mean, if, if the deadline is an important deadline, um, well, one thing of course is you know you can start planning in advance, but you know that just never happens. I tend to do things when uh, they are getting close to the end. My efficiency is much higher then. Um, yeah, I think in terms of one thing I have realized, I've actually stopped doing is that um, working at kind of really odd hours, like really late at night. Uh, for a deadline, that's thing because I found that um, I end up making mistakes. You know, I ended up I end up doing work that is actually not good. So I, I think it's it's better not to do that. So if it's a deadline, you know, if it's a midnight, I can I should try to do it by five p.m. <laughs> and then go home. Um, wait, waiting until the last moment is, is is just not good. Yeah. Maybe I can add a little bit to that. And I think Nishan, you are you are totally right. When her, you need to work for a deadline and there are no hours in a day to, to finish it, then you, you need to work them all. But I think it's very important to know a little bit of how do you perform? And it goes a little bit with what Nishan said. I mean, if you are very efficient in the morning, then you better get the, the most important tasks for that deadline in the morning. And if you need to work late hours, then leave what is easy. It's time consuming, but it maybe it doesn't require a lot of brain power and it's just pretty automatic, then you can do it whenever you're a little bit more tired. So it's it's kind of being a strategic and knowing yourself how how do you perform the best. I think that's that's the best way to go around it. Yeah, I would I would also add, um, at least for me, I'm a morning person. I woke up at four, I get my certificate things done and then I work after that. But then the key is check your work. Um, I know we, we all get things done, but at some point, if, if especially if something you have time to check, if you could check your work before sending it out at least twice, that will save you a lot, of, um, a lot of time or things you need to look into it. Just check your work. It's that, that represent who you are as a professional um, employer. Okay, um, any more comments on this one from our panelists? Not, we'll move to uh, <clears throat> our next question is uh, what recommendations would you give a manager or super, supervisor to help their direct uh, reports improve or maintain a good work-life balance? Uh, we'll start with Alvaro for this one. Sure, I think, I think any advisor or supervisor should uh, take a little bit of time to know who is working for them. Because I mean, we, we are all different. So maybe there are some people that need strict uh, time, like office time. Some others need more flexibility. Some people, as Sandra said, work in the morning, some others in the, in the afternoon. So giving that flexibility and not forcing people to do things that they, they, don't, they don't match what, what they are that's that's key i think knowing people it's it's the first thing that you need to do whenever you are managing those people it's it's about having them happy and, and flexible i think it's it's important thanks Alvaro. uh kila 
Yeah, so I'll kind of agree and build off what Alvaro said for supervisors. It's really being in tune with your direct reports and really keeping an eye on their quality of work and how they're acting. Uh, if their quality of work starts declining, if they their personality starts being a lot more on the pessimistic side, you can kind of see that change as long as you're paying attention. Uh, if you're not able to, you know, really dedicate and see that person on a day-to-day -day basis, hour to hour, uh, try to set up some time. Set it to the side, knock on their office door or just check in and make that time. And it, and it doesn't have to be something formal or some sort of formal meeting, um, but it's just asking the question of like, hey, how's it going? Hey, do you have too much on your plate? Do you feel like you're getting the balance and you're getting the support that you need? Um, and on that, understanding their personality type is also really important for that conversation. Are they detail-oriented people? Are they point A, point B type of people? Are they more fluid in their personality and more spontaneous with things and more open to things? Are they a yes person? Are they the type of person that will say yes to everything like me? I've learned that that's not a good thing, right? But as a manager, you have to understand what your direct report needs and their communication style and then adapt to that. Yeah, I could I could add to that. Um, so we all when we sign up, when we sign the contract of a job, you will get a list of tasks you need to get things done. And then when you actually start to work, the manager it usually help when the manager is really familiar with the technical aspect and how long it will take. But some manager is going to show up from whole different field and give some um, tasks, which sometimes not reasonable just because they need go through the whole process. So from that is you need to get things done, but then as a manager who knows the, how much time each task will take, it will give you a priority. If he didn't give you just go to his office, it's like, all right, which one get priority this week? And then you will get, all right, those two and the other ones will wait because we are waiting for something else. So it's kind of not really trying to say, all right, I, I can't, that's too much. It's he, you sign up for a specific tasks, so you still need to take care of them. Now, the point is you have eight or 10 hours per day. So communicate with the manager, all right, which one is a priority right now? And usually it's obvious because whether it's a deadline or committee meetings with a lot of technical things that need to be get, to get done. So as long as that's communicated well, if something moved down to the week after or a couple of days after, Nobody will call you and say, where is this? Because everybody knows this, this takes priority and this could wait for later. Good feedback, everybody. So right now we just have one question left in our audience from our audience. So if you guys have any remaining questions, we've got about 15 minutes left um, for us to go around the room. But this one I want to ask all of our panelists. And let's just give some really good final nuggets closing out. So what is one outstanding lesson about work-life balance that you guys can all share with the group? So we're gonna go around the room. Let's start with Nishant. Yeah, I'm quite not ready for it, but I think, <laughs> um, I, think uh, I guess one, um, if it has to be one nugget, I think really as you, wherever you are in your life and as you're kind of, you know, going towards the next step, if you can find things that, think, find things to do that really make you happy and you enjoy doing them, you know, uh, it's, for me, it's like, you know, I'm solving a puzzle while I'm working. So then I feel like then that's not so much of a work while I'm solving a puzzle and I'm getting paid for it. So if you can try to, and there will always be things which we don't like doing, um, but if you can reduce the proportion of the things you don't like and make the things you don't uh, like as a major portion of your work, uh, then I think this uh, work-life balance problem really uh, goes away. Yeah, I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm trying to go towards that. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> so sorry to put you on the spot. I thought that was good. So now, Keela, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you give us your final words of wisdom for how you maintain work-life balance? Sure. Um, I guess it's not very profound, but 
long story short, uh, I recently quit my job, moved across the country, and started working at a new company three weeks ago. Um, I started realizing at my old company that my work-life balance wasn't quite there, and I didn't really like geographically where I was living, like we had talked about earlier, right? If you want to be happy with where you live and what you're doing all around, right? So take the risk. If you're not happy, do something about it. That's that's my biggest thing is it's been so worth the risk of moving 2,300 miles across the country with my fiance and the cat and the whole shebang um, because it's what made me happy and it's what made my family happy. So if you're not happy, do something about it. Be empowered to do that. Hey, I think that's pretty profound. That is some good advice, especially for young employees. Sometimes it's scary to only work for a couple of years or one year or, you know, five years and then drop everything and move. But Kilo made it happen. So, so can you guys. Um, so I'm going to go to Alvaro. Do you have any gold nuggets for us to share about your work-life balance? Sure. And I, I really like what Kyla said. I, I, I agree with her. I mean, you need to be happy no matter what. And a lot of times it comes from the beginning. Whenever you are choosing your career path, you you need to understand what you where you want to go and find something that's going to take you there. And in the journey, if you realize that it's not taking where you want to go, then you just need to make a, a decision and, and change paths. And it's you need to do, you need to do it as soon as possible. You cannot leave it for tomorrow. I mean, it's your life. It goes quick, and and you need to be happy, and you need to do whatever it's needed for for that to happen. And, and that's what I what I try to do. And and if you are in a place that they are not valuing you enough, then that's not the place that you want to be. And, and that's how it goes. Very true. All right, let's go to Andres. And your advice cannot be to retire immediately. It has to be something <laughs> work in I was I was ready for it. <laughs> no, but I, I think it will come down to remember why you started. And, and the moment you... Uh, you have two options. You can look at all the bad things that happen every day, or you can look at the good things and, and, and try to describe your work to yourself as you want it to be. Like, for example, I, I describe my work in three easy sentences or bullets. I play with dirt. I break stuff and I tell people they're wrong. It's like a toddler. It's like a three-year toddler, but getting paid for it. And, and in that sense, I find enjoyment in every job I do. And, and I found some fun on every problem I solve. And I feel rewarded every time I can get, you know, the solution for one of my clients. And as long as you keep feeling rewarded and enjoy and appreciate it where you are, stay there. The moment you feel like you're not rewarded, you're not appreciated, it's time to move because... Again, our job is to head on, head on on the challenges. And, and the moment your job stops being challenging, you're not working. You're just showing up to an office. So if you're not going to a challenge every day, regardless of how you manage it, it is a challenge. The moment it's not challenging, you're just showing up to a box of concrete or wood, depending where you are, um, preferably concrete. And it's doing nothing to you because you're not growing. The moment that it's not challenging, you're not growing as a person or as a professional. So don't be afraid of moving. If you're here, it's because you are very well prepared. It's because you know your stuff and you're a really good professional. Uh, and in that sense, there is plenty of opportunities out there. If you feel like, uh, I, I don't like how they treat me or I don't like my salary or I don't like my benefits or Talk it through like a normal adult will do. The moment you feel like your opinion doesn't matter, it's time to pack it up and go. So uh, don't be afraid of it. And, and if someone is in that position at this moment, feel free to reach out to any of us. We'll be happy to, to help you out. But um, I have to agree with uh, everyone that you need to be happy and enjoy what you're doing and feel that at the end of the day, regardless of how many fires you have to put out, 
you feel accomplished and you feel like, yes, it was worth going to school, learning all of this and being able to do X, Y, and Z. And I feel happy every time I go home, um, even though there is a big hole in the middle of a highway and the traffic jam goes like 60 miles. I told them not to dig it, but it happens. Um, so feel happy, feel comfortable. And that will be the, my, my, main, uh, my main thing. All right, thanks, Andres. And then Samar to you, our last panelist. Yeah, so um, for a balance in general, I think it's it's kind of whatever time you're gonna take by the end of it, even if it's a short time, you need to feel that that time spent equally on achieving what you want personally and achieving what you want professional, because that will give you a balance. So getting things done, those things, you're going to decide which ones or which one gets priority, which one will make you feel good if you get them done. So having list of things need to be done and get them done on both aspects will help a lot. Um, now we are talking about jobs in general. Um, go through the job description. That will give you a good idea of what you're going to do. So see if you are passionate about it because that will be your entire time and it, it, most of your day working on it. So having something you're passionate about will, will help a lot going through any unbalanced time you need to go through. And then if you feel burned out, just take a break, take a couple of days, do whatever you want to do and then come back because it will happen. Plus the busier you are, the good indication of you, you are doing a really good job. So if you felt feels too much, just take your time, preferably merge that, um, Combine them with the weekends, you'll have really four days uh, if you want to. And then I know we are talking about a lot of balance and how balance is, but we also need to appreciate what we have because I know there are a lot of people that they can't even find a job. So appreciate what we have right now is a really good thing. Finding a positive or things you're interested in um, will help throughout. And then if all of that didn't work for you and then you decided to leave, always have plan B because sometimes it's just not, it doesn't work good all the way. So have plan B if everything you tried and it didn't work for you. Um, all right, Smart, thank you so much. Uh, Mohammed, my co-moderator now wants to leave you guys with a little bit of wisdom as well. Yes, it's not, uh, it's not much, I, I think, really is like if you look at it like work is kind of part of life i think it's a good way to to do it uh sometimes in life you're busy with like having you like you're married you just got a kid you can't just work as much as you want to and that's normal uh, but at the same time sometimes at work you are busy <laughs> You can't take your kid out to a soccer class. Uh, you promised to do something for Halloween, but you have to delay it a couple of hours. Uh, it's part of life. If you approach it that way and you have that good relationship with your work and your boss and your uh, firm, I think it just works itself out. Uh, but work is part of life, I think. It's a good way to look at it. Work is definitely life and life is sometimes work, but um, I guess my last pieces of wisdom to leave you guys with is, um, I think what I've learned a lot in my work-life balance over the last few years is how to know what your limits are and that there are limits and maybe your limits of how much you can do are different than your coworkers or your supervisors or your mentors. I do a lot of ACI and ASCE and work a full-time job where there's a lot of field work and a lot of computer work and lab work too. So I think just understanding what your limits are and maybe they'll change week to week based on how much sleep you've had or if you have a vacation coming up, but just understand that you have limits and they might be different from other people. And sometimes you might need to say no, even if you're a new employee, just so you can have a balance and not be working 800 hours a week. So don't be too afraid to say no but also don't be too afraid to say yes to new opportunities. Cause I know Samar hit on that a lot while she was one of our panelists this time. So that's all we have for you. We want to remind you guys that we do not have any PDH or professional development hours for this session. Um, 
unfortunately. So Lauren, I don't know if you want to say anything else about the committee before we leave today. Um, no, I did forget to introduce myself at the very beginning, um, but I, so my name is Lauren McCauley. I'm the chair of S806, uh, the Young Professionals Activities Committee. Um, and uh, I hope to see many of you at our committee meeting at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time today. So thank you all to our panelists and to our moderators. Um, this is a great session. I think um, a lot of people got a lot out of this. So appreciate all of your advice. All right, guys, thanks so much. Have a good day. Just one more uh, acknowledgement to our sponsors. Um, let me share my screen again uh, and we'll end it with that. Thank you again to all of our sponsors.